Alrighty. So I do this all the time. But I have never gotten this far along in the process. My kiln is fully loaded. I'm going to have to unload it because the cone is in there. I didn't set the kiln sitter. While I'm down here, Superman's going to help me with that. Um, there are several off switches that if your kiln has, you need to know about. Um, this is an off switch. This is an off switch. This is an off switch. And this is an off switch. Um, this is the percentage of power at which it, uh, it heats up at. And if your kiln clicks, like I can even see a spark through the, the grate down here, um, then you'll have a wheel like this. I start mine at one and a half and it clicks and clicks and clicks and clicks on and off, kind of slow ramps, um, it's thing, um, and uh, I started up at one and a half. Um, I and you can it, it, when we first got this kiln, um, you can feel in the wheel where the wheel is in kind of a neutral position, and that neutral position is off. Now that may or may not be. Ask me how I know. In between the two lines where it's telling you this is the off position um, we had to replace this was one of the things we had to replace and um, when we replaced it we realized it was in the wrong position this is a timer I generally set a bisque fire kiln at seven hours estimated firing time now estimated is um, important. This does not actually, it's not a clock. It just um, estimates how many hours you have been firing. This is how fast you want the kiln to heat up. I'm a normal speed girl. I'm a normal speed girl because the first kiln that I ever had, you plugged it in, it was on, you unplugged it, it was off. And so I'm not afraid of normal speed. I'm really thankful for that experience. Um, because, you know, I think, the, I think one of the only reasons that we have people that slow slow down their their speed is you know because people are putting wet stuff in their in their kiln that was the purpose you can put wet stuff in your kiln you can slow amp it up on one of those computer things for you know 10 hours and uh and it won't explode and that is true john the potter has a whole video about that <laughs> um but um without a programmable you got to make sure your stuff is is bone dry and if your stuff is bone dry and you know it's bone dry then this is already slowing down the temperature at which you're firing then this has to go underneath this because guess what that's an off switch and you got to push this button in and if you don't push the button in I'm like daddy I've got it set 
everything's on and it's not on. I don't understand. Again, because the kiln that I was working with, um, you know, you plug it in, it's on, you plug it in. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, there's five different ways for this kiln to shut off. I was missing this one right here. So you can you can see when I press it, it's on. But because there is actually a cone in the sitter, but because this isn't here, it won't stay, it won't stay in. So, um, so if this is up like this, it'll stay on. But as soon as I drop it, it's off. So, um, that's how the kiln sitter works. So, I got to go get Superman. And then we've got to um, unload the top two shelves, at least. Possibly the top three. And I've got to take the cone out, lift this, put it underneath the thing, put the cone back in to the kiln sitter. Um, and then I will be able to turn it on. I have, um, I have slowed it down before. There was one time that I got really scared. It was the first firing that I had just a, a lot of pieces that had real live actual wax bottoms and it started smoking and I freaked out. And I turned down the speed. I was like, I'll just turn it down until it stops smoking. Um, but anything burning in the kiln will cause it to smoke. I mean, that's the carbon coming off. So if you leave your leaves on or too much of your leaves on, they will smoke. If you um, put too much wax in the kiln, the wax will smoke. So... Um, so that's the, that's really the only time that I've ever not fired at normal speed. So, um, I would not feel comfortable putting something the least bit wet in the kiln. Um, but you know, if it explodes, you can always just turn it off. Unload it. Take the explosion out. Vacuum the kiln. Put it all back in. All that good stuff back in, and your your good cups. Superman, I need your help. Okay, let's talk kiln logs. So, um, I keep mine in Google Sheets. The date, the cone that's in the sitter. I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, if I'm doing it over again, I wouldn't necessarily put it in this order. But over here where I have babysitting, that's what I'm doing right now. I am babysitting the kiln. And if I hear anything that is funny in the first hour, um, most is a lot is sometimes those noises are just the metal sheeting uh, heating up and it and it moves. So if it's a small sound, it's not an explosion. If it's an explosion, you'll hear it. Um, and it will be very apparent and it will be around in my kiln at normal speed around the 45 minute mark. So I set a timer on my phone for, um, 30 to 45 minutes because I did not want to be inside going to the bathroom at that particular time. Um, 
But the other thing is I can see on here, the big information that I can see is the last time that I did a cone um, 04 firing, it took five hours and 15 minutes. So I know if this one takes eight hours, then something might be up. Um, if this one takes six hours, that's kind of long for a cone 04 firing in this kiln, but it's probably just the amount of uh, greenware that is in there right now. It's probably not anything to worry about. And the more and more you get, um, I've been firing this particular size kiln. Um, I've been, uh, uh, okay, I started this Let's put it that way. I started this um, kiln log online um, that, a year ago, and um, it was an 04 kiln, and it took seven and a half hours to fire. But I can look over here at the babysitting, and I didn't have anything listed under babysitting because I didn't realize I needed that. So I can log in all of my tests, like what am I testing in each kiln load? I should be testing something in each glaze kiln for sure. Um, uh, but I also have, this is the first time I fired, you know, B-mix clay, or this is the first time I fired, you know, a new type of clay or a new, um, whatever. Um, but here's, so here is, um, at 40 minutes, 5% power, um, I checked the temperature and it was steaming and the wax burned off at one to one and a half hours. So I got past the steam stage, <laughs> but the wax started burning off and it scared me to death. Um, so then I put the kiln on hold for 20 minutes, realizing it was wax. I returned it to normal speed. Um, and everything went as normal. I also have these red, you can see it right there. These red things, this was a failure. So I was trying to get to cone five. Um, and after one hour at 12.50, something broke. The temperature reading was 195 at that point. I have a little zap temperature. And so nothing should have broken. Um, but that, that was a failed kiln. It had a reglazed piece in there because I know because I wrote down the tests. I didn't write anything down on babysitting because I hadn't I hadn't added that column yet, and it was after that failure that I started adding that column. Um, the piece that broke was a refired piece, so it was already vit vitreous and it it broke um by turning the kiln off and letting that fail and babysitting the kiln i saved three pieces and a kiln shelf so i know how important it is to sit here and babysit um that was also when i really realized that oh my gosh i'm not recycling my slip water and we had a video about that not too long ago so, um, that piece, that was a failed kiln, but the next kiln did not fail. And I got everything else the next day, fired it up again. No problems. Less than six hours, uh, and it was a cone five kiln load. So, 
um, you really learn a lot from keeping a kiln diary. Um, so today, today's date, I started this at 11.23 in the morning and it has a cone 04 in the um, cone sitter. So, that's way more information than you wanted to know about kiln logging. But, while I'm sitting here babysitting, I get chatted. Water boils at 210 degrees, turns to steam. Let's go. Once all the steam is out of your bisqueware, nothing else is going to explode. Um, it might crack. It might break. But it's not going to explode. Okay, so it's been about 40 minutes. I have this little zapper dude, and he takes temperature. So I zap him in there, and I can see where he's hitting. At 210 degrees, that's where things explode. So I'm going to move this around. Like, here I can see it pointed at a cone. The cone's at 250 degrees. The Barry House window is at 280 degrees. The wall of the kiln is at 230 to 250 degrees. And that's the hottest spot in the kiln. So let's check the bottom. Always put your hand in front of the peak peepholes. I don't know if you could see that. Put your hand in front of the peephole so you don't get your face down there and get a face full of hot air. That's not fun. 202, 205, 206, 207. So most of the water is gone from that, but not all of it. The kiln shelf itself Kiln shelves are the last things to heat up because they're the most dense. And um, the kiln shelf itself is at like 180. Uh, so um, I'm going to wait a little while longer because if the things that are closest to the wall on that bottom shelf, the bottom shelf, it the bottom shelf is the last thing to heat up in a kiln because the heat rises to the top. So if the things on that very bottom shelf are only at um, 220, 210 degrees toward the outside, then toward the inside, they're still giving off a little steam. So I'm going to wait another... Mm, I could wait another 10 or 15 minutes and make sure that gets up over 250 degrees or so on that bottom shelf. Um, I could just set a time and, and that'll be right at an hour. So, you know, an hour works. Uh, this you can get anywhere. This is just a hardware. What's the temperature of whatever I'm pointing at? Not real accurate. However, um, they'll get you in the ballpark. Do you need one of these? No. But it will make you feel better if it's your first kiln load. Or if you are afraid to... Um, or if you want to hold through that temperature... If you're at manual kiln and you want to hold through that temperature where the um, uh, where the steam is coming off of the pot and what you would do is you would heat up your kiln until you get a reading of 175 degrees in there and then you would just watch it 
and hold it for however long you think it needs to be held for. So. There's my cones as seen through my peephole. I doubt that my camera will be able to take a picture of the cones bending, but that first cone will bend um, and let me know that it's getting close. And the second cone will then start to bend. And um, when that happens, um, the kiln sitter will uh, turn the kiln off because it's got one of those cones in it. Um, but everything in a kiln can fail from the computer ones um, to the kiln sitter to the timing mechanism and the cones can sometimes fall over. So you want cones in front of every peephole if you can um, get cones in front of every peephole just in case one set falls over. But the bottom line is the only thing that can tell you what has happened to your glaze and what has happened to your pots is those cones. Your computer can't tell you that. Nobody's computer can tell you what happened to your glaze or why it ran or why it didn't run or why it um, no, nothing, nothing can help with that except those cones. So always put cones, no matter what kind of cone you have in. Um, and if that cone is bent and it looks perfect through that peephole and your kiln sitter hasn't popped off, turn it off. Turn it off. You're smarter than your kiln sitter. And you're smarter than your computer. So, um, don't, don't be afraid to turn off the kiln when you know the cone is telling you it's finished. Don't be afraid. Don't be scared. You can do it. All done. <laughs> That's pretty much all she wrote, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the It's too bright in there to get a picture of the cone. Um, and you can't really see them very well either just because the way the kiln is loaded. But uh, that, see this? I won't stay up there anymore. So he's all done. I've got 30 minutes left on the timer. And, um, and yeah, it hit full power at the number seven and a half. At this point, I am going to plug up the top peephole and that will, um, slow down the cooling rate, but that's just a glaze specific thing too. You hear all kinds of things about slowing down your kiln and all that kind of stuff. Um, you, if you cool it off too fast, you'll, your stuff will craze. Well, your stuff, if it's going to craze, is going to craze. It just means that if you don't open your kiln, um, you may not hear it crazing. <laughs> so if you don't want to hear it, Wait until your cool, kiln is all the way cooled down. <laughs> Otherwise, there's this little prop. And you can prop your lid um, if you want to prop your lid. Um, my grandmother, as soon as that thing dropped, would she would uh, wait a couple hours and then prop the lid. There is one thing, though, that I would never do, and that is um, I, I would use my little zap gun. Um, and I would not open it. There's a quartz inversion that happens at 500 degrees. And so I would wait until it was down below 500 degrees. But I don't think my grandmother did that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that. But so, yeah, under 500 degrees, um, you're totally 
you're good to go. You can prop the lid open, let it cool off. It's no big deal. Um, and any kind of movement that you were going to get in your, um, if you're looking for runny glazes and all that kind of stuff, any kind of movement that you're going to get stops at that 500 degree mark for sure. Um, because of the quartz inversion. So go forth and fire your stuff. Be not afraid. And I'm so very sorry for the long length of this video. Um, but I hope that you feel like it was all good information. I mean, for me, I wanted a book. And there was nothing out there. And, you know, so it was just... And I think for most people it is. Just figure it out on your own. Um, but if I can help in any way, then... Let me know. Thanks. See you later.